thank you for our class tonight as we look at lesson number five in our course, Understanding the Bible. We praise you. We thank you and honor you. You are so wonderful, Lord. You are so wonderful. Now bless us, Lord. Let your anointing be upon your people. Uh, give us wisdom and knowledge and understanding. And Father, bless each and every one. We thank you for the good report from Zizla about her friend Israel. We thank you that you're moving mightily and bringing him back, Lord. And we thank you that you're moving in our lives and in the lives of our nation as you're restoring people to you. And all over the world, you're bringing people into the knowledge of Jesus Christ as Savior and Lord. We lift up Paul and Heidi as they um, uh, wind up their work in in uh, in um wherever they are <laughs> wherever they are i think they're in new orleans or somewhere but bring them back safely lord restore them give them rest and prepare them for the next venture we thank you and we praise and honor you in jesus mighty name let the church say amen let the chat window uh say amen praise god okay okay tonight we're looking at lesson number five you know do you know we're almost Hey, Jeep, we're almost halfway through this course. We're almost halfway through this course. I love it. I love it. I love it. Okay, so lesson number five. Students should read all of lesson five in the textbook and answer the exercise and response questions. These are the self-test questions. Now, you don't have to send me the self-test that's in Appendix A, okay? We have self-test questions, which are actually response and exercise questions in each lesson. Those are the questions that I want. I want you to answer those questions, send them to me. Um, and then each week, when you finish the particular lesson, go to Appendix A and take that self-test. But you don't have to send me the results of that self-test. You take it just to see where you are and uh, see what you need to fine tune. But send me the answers to the questions that appear at the end of each chapter. Okay, alrighty. And when you take the self-test in Appendix A, once a week you take the self-test, the answers to the self-test are in Appendix B of the textbook. Students are to memorize Job 19 and 25. Job 19 and 25, Sharon Hudson, Sharon Hudson. I didn't uh, put it, put the song up on, on my other computer. And Sharon Hudson, can you come open, unmute your mic, your phone, and can you sing? Can you kindly sing? Uh, ladies and gentlemen, this is Sharon Hudson. She has put scriptures to song. Sharon, I, if you're able, um, you're, would you please sing to us? your rendition of Job 19 and 25. Okay, so it's Job 19, 25. Can y'all hear me? Yes. Okay. <laughs> For I know that my Redeemer liveth, and that he shall stand at the latter day upon the earth. For I know that my Redeemer liveth, and that he shall stand at the latter day upon the earth. Praise God. Praise God. Thank you. Thank you, Sharon. There you have it, ladies and gentlemen. Twice she sang, for I know that my Redeemer liveth, and that he shall stand upon at the latter day upon the earth. And we thank God. And, and if you want any of Sharon's songs, she's willing to share them with you. And um, I think Sharon has already given me permission to give you her email address. That's shudson0123, shudson0123 at gmail.com. Thank God for Sharon. Th Sharon is teaching us a way, a new way to learn the scriptures. Okay, we're looking at um, the Old Testament books of poetry. Already we have 17 books 
in our repertoire. We've learned, we've studied 17 books of the Bible, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, Joshua, Judges, Ruth, 1st and 2nd Samuel, 1st and 2nd Kings, 1st and 2nd Chronicles, Ezra, Nehemiah, and Esther. Now we're going to add the five books of poetry. Uh, Job, Psalms, Proverbs, Ecclesiastes, and Song of Solomon. Tonight's lesson is Job, Psalms, Proverbs, Ecclesiastes, um, Song of Solomon. Job, Psalms, Proverbs, Ecclesiastes, and Song of Solomon. Song of Solomon is also known as the Song of Songs, and it's also known as Canticles, C-A-N-T-I-C. L E S. So some Bibles the, list the book as Canticles, Song of Solomon or Song of S Songs. Okay, uh, let's take the background, the background of Job. I'm not going to go through much of each of these books, uh, but we'll give you the background. Then as you can, as you can read portions of these uh, books, read portions of these books. This course gives you an overview of the Bible. You will know more about the Bible, ladies and gentlemen, when you finish this course than a lot of pastors know. A lot of pastors don't know the Bible as you're getting taught in this course. So we give God the praise. Written sometime between the 15th to the 2nd century BC. So that's a long time span. Um, where many scholars don't know who the writer was and when the time setting was, but we're going to kind of nail it tonight. The book of Job still has no clearly identifiable author. Some biblical scholars say that the author is anonymous, while others attribute the authorship to either Moses or Solomon. The central message of the book of Job, and remember, it's not Job. You can tell if a preacher don't know his Bible if the preacher says, open up to the book of Job. No, there's no book of Job. There's no book of Titus. There's a book of Titus. And by the way, there's no book uh, of, of, of uh, Hezekiah. And uh, uh, so we, we learn the, the proper pronunciation of, of these books in this course. The central message is the suffering of the godly and the sovereignty of God or someone asks why do the righteous suffer and the the, the wicked uh, get over another theme is blessing through suffering Job stands alone among the books of the Old Testament it forms a part of the Bible known as wisdom literature or the books of poetry also known as wisdom literature. No one really knows who wrote it or just when it was written, but the story is set in the days of the patriarchs. Job was a wealthy and an influ influ influential sheik, or sheikh as some people pronounce it. He was rich in terms of flocks and herds. Rather, rather than cash, he had cattle and all kinds of herds, and that uh, he was very, very wealthy. Genesis 46, 13 lists Job as a son of Issachar. And so Job may have been, uh, this may be the Job we're talking about, the son of Issachar. If this happens to be the same Job, then he was the grandson of Jacob. In Numbers 26, 24, his name is listed as Jashub. J-A-S-H-U-B. So this might be the son of Issachar, um, the uh, grandson of Jacob. Here's a brief explanation about the book of Job. Chapters 1 and 2 are not poetry but prose. Um, the poem begins with Job 3 and ends with Job 42, 6. Now, when we say Job is a poem, it doesn't mean that it, it rhymes. No, there's no real rhythm in the book. Um, but we see uh, it is called a poem. We see in uh, between Job 3 and Job 42, verse 6, that divine counsel took place without Job's knowledge. In, other, in order to understand what happened to Job, 
and brothers and sisters in order to understand what's happening in our lives and what happens in the lives of others we've got to know that divine intervention takes place stuff happens in the divine realm that we have no clue about god and satan entered into a dialogue concerning job we see this in the book this dialogue or this conversation and its reality should serve to enlighten us about why we often go through the trials that we encounter in life without job's knowledge his trials originated in heaven where god accepted satan's challenge concerning job we see in job that satan goes up to the throne of god and satan is boasting and satan has access to the throne of god he can go up there anytime he wants to and he is the accuser of the brethren we get that in the book of jude of jude that is why when whenever we sin we should confess our sins right away so that satan cannot accuse us before the lord and the lord will stand up hearing our sins and he says the lord rebuke you so satan has access to the throne of god and on this occasion he went up to god and said i've been down to the earth i've seen all that you have you don't have anybody worshiping you you know satan is a liar He's the father of lies. He's the author of lies. He can't do anything but lie. He 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 um, uh, distorts the truth. And God said, not so, not so. Satan said, I, you don't have anybody following you down there. God said, not true, not true. Have you considered my servant Job? Oh, man, Job, well, you got a hedge around him. You're protecting him, him Lord. I mean, you babying him. I mean, you're babysitting Job. You won't let me get to him. You got a fence around him. Uh, and uh, but if you remove that fence from him, hmm, I'll have him cursing you like the rest of the earth is cursing you. And God said, and God had confidence in Job. God has and God has confidence in us, ladies and gentlemen, in the Holy Ghost in us. God has confidence that we can stand any test. So if you're going through a test, remember, uh, these tests are often not you. These tests are not, often not you, but these tests are not off are often not you but are something else going on I'm trying to get my picture back on here okay these tests are not you but something is going on in the heavenlies and so sometimes we cry why me why am i going through this it may be it may just be it may be that satan is challenging your integrity before god and so god said to satan you can do anything you want but don't you kill him don't you kill him and as you read in job job put a hurting uh satan put a hurting on job but job did not curse god job did not turn from god he hung in there with god and later god rewarded him rewarded him for his faithfulness the thing i want to emphasize and encourage you to know is a lot of things that you go through you have no control over but remember you belong to jesus he said i will never leave you nor will i forsake you god wants us to walk by faith and not by sight and tell people uh receive jesus and walk by faith and not by sight don't walk by what your circumstances are telling you because your circumstances will not give the real 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 story walk by faith in what god's word says god's word is a lamp unto our feet and a light unto our our path so if you're going through something you just fix your eyes on jesus praise god you look for spontaneity you find a quiet place you keep your mind stayed on the lord and wait to see what god will do god is going to show up he will show up job waited as we read throughout this book job waited on the lord job waited on the lord and the song that sharon sang is a testimony that job put his trust in the lord and he said i know i mean here's a man sitting out on the town dump sores on his body dogs licking his sores his wife has told him you need to just curse god and die look at you you're pathetic and she even turned against him his friends accused him of having hidden sins and they condemned him 
But Job just sat out on the town dump and he said, he said, I know that my Redeemer lives. And that's faith, ladies and gentlemen, when you're going through, when you're going through and you have the audacity to say, I know that my Redeemer lives and he shall stand on the earth at the latter day. And on another occasion, Job was going through, I mean, really, his friends, everybody in town laughing at him. He was so pathetic, lost everything he had. And and uh, and he said, I'm going to wait until my change comes. That's faith, ladies and gentlemen. That's faith. That's putting your eyes on the Lord and 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 not drifting. We need to stay fixed on the Lord. Amen. Don't turn back. Don't let any circumstances turn you back. Oh, man, I keep on preaching. I'm supposed to be teaching on Wednesday night. I keep on preaching. But don't let anything turn you back. Satan wants to turn you back. He wants to destroy you. But don't let anything separate you from the love of God. Keep your eyes on Jesus and you will get the victory. Keep your eyes on Jesus and he will give you the victory. We serve an awesome God. We serve a mighty God. We don't serve Allah or Buddha or Baha'u'llah. We don't so serve Shinto. We don't serve gods made out of man's hands. We don't serve them. We serve the living God. And as we celebrate Easter Sunday, Resurrection Sunday, this coming Sunday, we celebrate the God who came down from heaven because he loves us so much and he offered himself on the cross for our sins. He died to take away our sins. He removed the curse from us, delivered us from sin and shame, gave us eternal life, and he uh, allowed himself to be put to death and and uh, he laid in the grave and on the third day he arose from the dead he said all power is in my hands and then he said I give you the keys to the kingdom whatsoever you shall bind on earth shall be bound in heaven whatsoever you shall loose on earth shall be loose in heaven so we serve the mighty God. Don't turn from him no matter what you're going through. Just wait on the Lord. Ladies and gentlemen, we serve an on-time God. He might not come when you want him, but he's always, always, always on time. Zizla, you go back to Israel and say, we serve the on-time God. He knows what you're going through. He knows what's happening. He's right on time. And so, ladies and gentlemen, though we don't have any control over what's happening to us, it just might be, ladies and gentlemen, that you are a target of the enemy. He's trying to shut your ministry down. He's trying to shut your household down. He's trying to prevent your grandson from becoming the president of the United States. He's trying to stop the seed that God has planted in your in your family from becoming what God wants him to. To, or her to become but you've got to wait on the Lord commit your life to the Lord and don't let anything or anybody turn you around that's a little bit of what we're getting from the book of Job praise God so let's flip next uh, we're gonna not gonna look at those dialogues even though all of his religious friends had answers Eliphaz so far they all had answers. We know why you're suffering. You committed some secret sin. Mm-hmm. Yeah, we know you've been. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Well, you know how people are. But Job, Job maintained his integrity, and he waited on the Lord. He waited on the Lord, and then God showed up. God showed up in a whirlwind, and God will show up in your situation. You just wait on it. Just wait. Just wait. And the scripture says, and having done all, stand, stand, therefore, having your loins girded about with truth, having on the breastplate of righteousness, the helmet of salvation, having your feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. Put on the full armor of God, ladies and gentlemen, and just wait, just wait on the Lord. Just wait on the Lord. Where is my picture? <laughs> Where is? OK. Um, praise God. Just wait on the Lord. Man, that's the old me. That's the Green Beret me. Where is my picture? Okay. Well, praise God. We just keep on. You just have to look at that picture if you're looking at the screen tonight. The next book is the book of Psalms. The book of Psalms. Psalms. 
put that S on the end, Psalms, and the second of the poetic books. These Psalms have their setting in the arena of human experience, written between 1000 BC and 300 BC. David did not write them all. You will see on pages, on, on pages, uh, on page 110 and 111, you'll see who some of the writers of the Psalms were, but we do not know. We cannot identify all of the writers of the Psalms. We can't identify all of the writers. And so David did not write them all. He compiled some of them. Others were compilations, meaning, meaning they gathered the writings, uh, the spiritual writings, and uh, David did write a lot of them. I'd like to recommend that you learn the Psalms. Do what Sharon is doing. Sharon sings these songs. She commits them to song, uh, uh, to singing. Uh, write them down. As you memorize blocks of scripture, you can walk through this life with power. Any situation coming up, you can put a word on it. And years ago, I began teaching my congregation, learn the Psalms, learn how to memorize them. And um, I can recite Psalm 1, Psalm 23, Psalm 24, uh, Psalm 34, Psalm 27. Uh, and these are powerful Psalms. Ye though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. When even your dog and your cat are trembling, uh, near the doorway, you can say, yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death. Or, you know, here's my favorite. When Satan, Satan often attacks me with a, a, a terroristic attack while I'm asleep at night. He likes to sneak up on you while you're asleep at night and you're in the Z zone. You know, cutting the hogs, calling those hogs, you know. Uh, as Jackie says, man, you were snoring last night. Well, sometimes Satan attacks me during my sleep time. And, and tries to get me into fear. And I've had occasions where I've awakened in a cold sweat and, and trembling, and he wants to put fear on you. But ladies and gentlemen, the cure, the cure for fear, Psalm 91. You put some Psalm 91 on the devil, you put some Psalm 91 on the devil, or you started praying while you're sleeping, you start praying in tongues while you're sleeping, or put Psalm 91, you sit up in your bed and say, uh, 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 repeat Psalm 91, he that dwelleth in the secret place, and personalize it. Pers take these Psalms and personalize them. Uh, uh, I dwell in the secret place of the Most High. I shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. I will say of the Lord, he's my refuge and my fortress. My God in him will I trust. Surely he shall deliver me from the snare of the fowler and from the noisome pestilence. Personalize it. And when you hear yourself uh, prophesying, that's prophesying, ladies and gentlemen. You're prophesying to yourself. Uh, uh, you can't sleep, so you start prophesying to yourself. You start speaking the word of God. The devil will flee. The rats will flee. If you got roaches in your house, they will flee. Water bugs, they will flee. Mice will flee. They can't see. The devil can't stand to be around the word of God. You got a problem in your house. You got mice. You got rats. And you don't have a cat. Start praying the word of God. Walk around your house praying the word of God. The mice will leave, ladies and gentlemen. The water bugs. I know, Pastor Carter. I'm out there. I'm out there. I can't help it. I'm a green beret for Jesus. I can't help it. The green beret set explosives behind enemy's lines, and then we split the scene and let the explosives go off. I was trained to do that. But then when I gave my life to Jesus, I became a green beret for Jesus, and I go wherever God sends me, and I, I ignite his word, and I plant the word of God in people, and then I get out of, this, out of the way because the word will not return. Hallelujah. The word will not return until the Lord empty it will accomplish what he's purposed it to do it will prosper in the thing wherein he sent it so learn the psalms learn the psalms learn how to uh as lisa cantrell smith says i speak to storms ladies and gentlemen you can speak to the storm if there's a tornado coming your way a cyclone you can speak to that storm ken copeland and his wife were flying one time and they saw this uh 
big storm coming up and it was tornadic looked like a tornado coming to us their plane and Ken said he had he had a mission he was on a mission God was sending him somewhere and he said he was not gonna let any storm keep him from going where God sent him to go and he spoke to that storm he looked out the window of that plane and he spoke to that storm he said you get out of here you go you go north you get out of here disappear he said that storm disappeared ladies and gentlemen and you can expect Experienced the same thing. I was preaching an outdoor revival one night, one week. We had prayed and fasted for an outdoor crusade. Ladies and gentlemen, in that outdoor crusade, the first one I ever did, 33 people got saved. 33 people got saved during that week. We just set the chairs out on the parking lot and preached the gospel. But Satan tried to shut it down. He threatened the storms. The weatherman said storms. And, and God said, no, 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 I want you to preach whether it rains or not. I said, God, I don't want it to rain. We don't want a storm. Lord said, well, speak to the weather. Speak to the weather. Ladies and gentlemen, we commanded the storms not to come. And it did not rain for that entire week. Guess when it rained? Mm-hmm. The next week after the crusade was over. So, ladies and gentlemen, we're talking about a powerful, powerful, a powerful thing. When you get the word of God in you, when you hear God's word, whether it's the written word or the rhema word, and you start speaking that word uh, to that situation or the people. That's what prophets do. You're in a school of prophets. You don't have to be called to be a prophet. A prophet is a person who will hear from God and who will speak what God says do. Ladies and gentlemen, you're getting trained, you're getting sharpened, you're getting fine-tuned so you can flip this world back to where God wants it to be. God wants to use you. So stay in training, stay in training, stay in training, and let the Lord prepare you. So we learn from the Psalms. The Psalms have helped a lot of people in a lot of situations. Um, many people do what Sharon Hudson do. They uh, take the Psalms and turn them into songs and singing. And, and there are songs. When I, when I first began pastoring, we didn't even have, uh, uh, we had an old upright piano, but nobody could play it. Uh, I told you about the cowbells and the rhythm, rhythm sticks, and then somebody brought in an old snare drum. We beat that drum to death. We had no music. We had our hands clapping and our feet stomping and, and rhythm sticks, and that cowbell that they eventually took away from me, they said, you got to get rid of that cowbell. Come, Pastor, you're going crazy with that cowbell. But that was, uh, that, was, that was our music. And then I began to teach people. It was a deliverance ministry. God put me in a deliverance ministry. I didn't know what deliverance really was. But he put me, said, I'm going to in introduce to this city a deliverance ministry through this church. And we, praise God, I mean, we would put the word of God on a situation. We would see demons leave, people get healed. We saw miracles. All these were God's workings. And we began to sing songs. And I had people with that call me on the phone, Pastor, sing me a song. Sing me a song. I can't sleep. Sing me a song. My husband's sleep. I'm sick. My my wife is sick. Sing me a song. Encourage me. Encourage me with a song. So we take, and my favorite was Psalm 34. I will bless the Lord at all times. His praise shall continually be in my mouth. My soul shall make her boast in thee, Lord. The humble shall hear thereof and be glad. Oh, magnify the Lord with me. And let us exalt his name together. I saw the Lord, and he heard me, and delivered me from all my fears. That Psalm 34 has blessed a lot of people. We put it to song. Then there was, uh, whenever we, people would be afraid, I would tell them, no, remember what God has done for you. And then we'd sing a song like, I can run through a troop, leap over a wall hallelujah hallelujah he's my strength and my shield he gives power to all hallelujah hallelujah oh i am free from condemnation jesus is the rock of my salvation i can run through a troop leap over a wall hallelujah hallelujah we got that straight from david david said by thee i have run through a troop 
leaped over a wall. And so we put the Psalms, we put the Psalms to song. Uh, we do a Sharon Hudson thing and, and, and share it with people, share it with people. Praise God. We've got people singing some of these songs all over Africa, all over Europe. Amen. So what God gives us, we share with others. And that's another way, another way of being prophetic, putting the word of God, putting the word out there so people's lives can change. Praise God. So we're not going to spend a lot more time with the Psalms because time sure gets away uh, from us. Okay, the Psalms express the whole range of human feelings and experience from dark depression to exuberant joy. Um, the Psalms are good for teaching doctrine. They are good for uh, liturgical and congregational use. And so look over this assignment and um, here's something I find quite interesting on page 113. Near the bottom, when you read Psalm 22, and it's good for you to do that this week as we look at Jesus on the cross and compare it, math, compare it with Matthew 27. Read Psalm 22 and compare it with Matthew 27. You'll think that both of these passages were written at the same time, yet they were written hundreds of years apart from each other, about a thousand years apart. One is uh, prophesying, David's prophesying the death of Jesus on the cross. I mean, I mean, word for word, prophesying the death of Jesus on the cross. And then Matthew 27, uh, where the Lord is risen. He is risen. Uh, he's not in, in the tomb. He's, he is risen. Okay. At the time of the writing of Psalm 22, death by crucifixion was a thing unknown. It was later introduced by the Romans. So uh, Psalm 22 describes Jesus' death, the Messiah's death by crucifixion, a thousand years before he was crucified. How's that for divine inspiration of the scriptures? So that's the book of Psalms. Flipping next to the book of Proverbs, we'll briefly cover the book of Proverbs. It's a book of practical wisdom, something all of us need today, practical wisdom. It's a book of divine wisdom that is applied to earthly conditions. In these days where people are saying anything, thinking anything, doing anything that comes to their mind, Proverbs is an anchor. The book of Proverbs is an anchor. And I love Proverbs 3, 5, and 6. The Lord continues to speak that to my spirit. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Do not lean unto your own understanding. In all your ways, acknowledge him, and he will uh, direct your paths. So Proverbs is practical wisdom. And um, Solomon was the son of David and Bathsheba. He's given credit for Proverbs, but he did not write them all. He compared. He compiled them. Solomon was, was rich enough. He could travel anywhere. He could send out people to go and secure for him literature. He had libraries and he compiled uh, um, fruitful sayings. And um, some of them he wrote, but most of them are parts of a compilation. Others who wrote Proverbs were Agur and Lemuel, both who were not Jews. Um, King Hezekiah wrote uh, and compiled some of the Proverbs. The central message of the book is the wisdom of God or universal principles for living. You want to know how to live? Go to the book of Proverbs. Now, Proverbs does not cover every aspect of human life. It covers a great deal of the things we deal with and what we have to face. That is why uh, in this course, and in previous course, the previous course, we're teaching you to learn how to go to God for yourself. You belong to God. Jesus purchased you on the cross. You belong to him. You died. You were crucified with him, according to Galatians 2.20. So since we have been crucified with Christ, we are no longer living. Yet Christ lives in us. And the life that we live in the flesh, we live by the faith 
of the Son of God. So since the Son of God lives in us, in the person of the Holy Spirit, tap into that river of living water on the inside of you, ladies and gentlemen. No matter what situation you're facing, no matter what comes upon you, you can tap into the river of living water and get the answer. Or you can read the scriptures and get the answer. Find out what... Uh, David did in this kind of situation. Find out what Paul did in this kind of situation. Find out what the Holy Spirit would have you to do. The, the answer comes to the scripture, or the answer may come through a rhema word. The answer may come through prayer. That is why uh, God says, draw nigh unto me, and I will draw nigh unto you. Ladies and gentlemen, we are so blessed to be saved and set free by the blood of Jesus. And uh, accepted in the beloved. God has accepted us into his family. And so he's training us. He's raising up a, a, a an army of worshipers. He's getting us to the place where he intended us to be from the beginning. Psalm 139, 14 says, I am fearfully and wonderfully made that I may worship him. So a lot of us have had to go through some stuff. But thanks be to God for Jesus Christ who died on the cross for us so that we can be saved and redeemed from the curse. And now that we're saved, now he's drawing us unto him by his spirit. It is so awesome. God is drawing you and me into his presence by the Holy Spirit. And as we study the word and keep our eyes on him and pray and love one another, ladies and gentlemen, don't let the sun go down on your wrath. Don't be bitter towards anyone. If somebody offends you, forgive them. Well, pastor, you don't know what they did. No, and I don't care what they did. Forgive them. Forgive them. When you forgive them, God blesses you even more. So that's Proverbs. Ecclesiastes, ladies and gentlemen, Ecclesiastes is a book uh, probably written by Solomon or his writers, his compilers, and it's uh, the evidence is that Solomon wrote Ecclesiastes in his later years. You know, uh, in his later years, Solomon had done almost anything under the sun. He said, there's nothing new under the sun, and he's also saying, and I did it, and I did it. Uh, he did. In his latter years, he backslid. Solomon backslid. Solomon allowed uh, altars to be, to be built for on top of the temple, on top of the temple of God. He had altars built for his, for the gods of his wives and concubines. In other words, Solomon, as he grew older, he started losing it. He started losing his grip. He started losing his grip on God. And, and, and uh, you know, all, um, he had too many wives, too many women, too many women in his life. And, and, and they just led him in all, all different in all different directions solomon solomon must have been a freak he must have been a freak in his later years uh going in 360 different directions and having a thousand wives and 700 women <laughs> lisa cantrell says too many women will do that that's what lisa put in the chat with her too many women will do that ladies and gentlemen if you've got one you better take good care of her. I know Jackie gonna say amen. Uh, you got one. You better take care of her. Amen. You can't. You can't take care of all these women out there. Uh, no, 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 no. Be faithful to the one you got, uh, and and trust the Lord. But Solomon just lost it, and so in his latter days, we believe he wrote Ecclesiastes. So Ecclesiastes, everything in it is not script. It's not uh, uh, spiritual. Everything in Ecclesiastes is not spiritual. However, this book was approved by the bishops in, in the fourth century BC. This book was approved by the bishops and it was approved to be canonized. In other words, accepted as uh, uh, from God. Okay, so you'll learn a lot from Ecclesiastes. Um, I think one of Jackie's favorite scriptures is Ecclesiastes 3, Jackie. Yes. Could you share a portion of that? Well, I like the fact that it talks about time 
and there being a time for everything under the sun, because all too often, sometimes we think that things have to happen in our time. But I like the fact that God says there is a time for everything. And it's just not all the good, but those things that we may deem as bad, but there is a time, God's time. And uh, that is definitely my favorite Old Testament scripture. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. To everything, there's a season. Time to uh, rejoice, a time to laugh, time to cry. But God's got us in his hands. So praise God. No matter what your times are like these days, trust the Lord, ladies and gentlemen. Trust the Lord. Trust the Lord. And um, don't go off the deep end. Uh, uh, some, we, see, we see people who backslide. And, and uh, backsliding is dangerous. If you get out there like Solomon did, it may not be a point of, of return. And so Solomon did write this, and he warned us. Uh, he said he's tried everything under the sun, and nothing works. So praise God he had, had the courage to say the only thing that works is to love the Lord, fear the Lord. Fear the Lord, ladies and gentlemen. Fear the Lord. Everything else is vanity. Everything else is vanity vanity so study uh, from the book of Proverbs okay and um, learn what God says through the preacher the Keholeth the preacher okay the last book and we want to finish this before our time runs out time sure gets away from us the book of song the song of Solomon the song of Solomon ladies and gentlemen if there's any book that seems like it is not spiritual this book ain't from the, from the outset, it ain't spiritual, but the 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 Jewish rabbis they accepted it as being spiritual, and they related it to uh, a person's love for God. But when you look at Song of Solomon, if you are not careful, this thing is sensual. Man, I remember when I was in college pledging for the fraternity. My big brothers in the fraternity would force all uh, the guys who were ple the pledges. We would have to take write love letters to their girlfriends and they would give us scriptures and they would always give us something out of song of solomon to write in a letter and compose a letter to their girlfriends man we were messing with scripture i had I, I was dumb i was ignorant i was lost i did not know jesus and uh writing a love letter for uh, a big brother in college using scriptures um but song of solomon um when you look at it it's sensual. It is sensual. It is sexy. Okay. But then all scripture is given for inspiration by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in living. And um, Jackie just put a quote in the in the chat room that I've mastered this. Look, I've been going around saying this to Jackie. Here's what I've been saying to her all week. And she loves it, ladies and gentlemen. She loves it. Because so, I'm learning this in the course I'm taking that I'll be teaching you next month, next next semester, Introduction to the Prophetic. One of the scriptures we're to learn is proper, is Song of Solomon 4, verses 9 and 19. Thou hast, thou hast ravished my heart, O my sister, my spouse. Thou hast ravished my heart with one of your eyes and one of the chains on your neck. I've been saying that to Jackie. Thou hast ravished my heart, O oh my sister, O oh my spouse. Thou hast ravished my heart with one of your eyes and one of the chains around your neck. And then, and then, and then that scripture said, the 19th verse, Awake, O north wind, uh, uh, come, uh, thou south wind, blow upon my garden. And so that the spices thereof will will flow out. So so uh, the Shulamite woman is saying, "Come, wind, blow upon my garden, so that uh, my 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 husband he will come and eat from his garden and eat of his uh, his favorite fruits, his pleasant fruits." Ladies and gentlemen, that ain't hardly scriptural. 
That ain't hardly spiritual. I mean, it's in the scripture, but that ain't hard. And Jackie been just smiling all over herself all week, ladies and gentlemen. Y'all need to pray for my wife, Jackie. She was smiling all over herself all week because I've been talking stuff. I've been talking and I've been talking stuff to her from the scripture. I know, I know I need to repent. Jeep, I need to repent. I've been talking stuff to her from the scripture talking about uh, thou hast ravished my heart, oh, my sister. Oh, my spouse, you've ravished my heart. You've destroyed my heart with just one look, one look. You gave me one glance and you blew me off the earth, off the planet. You have ravished my heart. I've been telling Jackie that she just been smiling all. all Jackie Fisher, she's just smiling all over herself. And then uh, the Shulamite told, said, uh, blow on me, north wind, and you blow on me, south wind. And, and, uh, uh, um, uh, blow upon my garden and her garden her garden her garden she talks about the various plants and veggies growing in her garden the fruits in her garden but she ain't hardly talking about beans and collard greens and cabbage and tomatoes and stuff she ain't talking about that y'all she ain't talking about that she's talking about some of her pleasures and says she wants her beloved to come and uh, eat from the garden and enjoy himself and ladies and gentlemen that ain't preachable that ain't hardly preachable but you know here's what here's what the church has done and praise God hallelujah praise God for the Holy Spirit the Lord takes the song of Solomon and relates it uh, he relates the marital of now that's not for folks shacking up that ain't for this book is not for uh, somebody want to hit on somebody's wife or that this is for marital love the Song of Solomon describes marital love. This is Solomon. Now, now you might challenge Solomon because he had, you say, how can he love one woman when he loved a thousand wives and 700 concubines? Well, he took time and wrote the Song of Solomon about his love for the Shulamite woman. And it's all about marital love. And this book relates marital love with the love of Jesus Christ for the church hallelujah i mean the holy spirit just makes it so wonderful that that if a man can love his wife that much and she can just wait for him wait for the wind to blow upon her garden and 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 spread her spices all over the place so she can blow the man's mind uh uh then the lord has a greater a greater anointing upon us being his children, being his children, being born again by the Spirit of God. God wants to cultivate the love we have for him, and he wants to show love for us. The love God has for us is greater than any marital pleasures or any conjugal love, any marital love. So we've been able uh, to take this scripture and with the help of the Holy Spirit, just uh, show the love of God. For his church praise God I think I'll stop while I'm ahead I'll stop while I'm ahead praise God but uh I still have in my heart I probably say to Jackie later on thou hast ravished my heart oh my sister my spouse <laughs> praise God y'all pray for me that I stay on track stay on track Praise God. I, I've been blessed. I've been blessed, been blessed with a wonderful wife. She is so wonderful. Jack and I have only been married for seven years, but it's been a wonderful seven years. Praise God. Uh, God brought us both out of a, a, a past of pain and hurt and, and, and placed us in a position where, where he can show us love and, and we're growing. We're growing. We, we haven't arrived yet, but we're getting there but i thank god i thank god he's a god of a second chance he's a god of mercy and grace and and he's showing grace in your lives and i pray that god will do exceedingly abundantly above all that any of you could ask or think praise god so that's it as far as our assignment is for this week read your assignment answer your questions if i can help you with any questions i'll be glad to um Continue to trust in the Lord with all your heart. Uh, the scriptures, we, we, we get a whole array of things in the scriptures, but God has a purpose for everything that's in this Bible, and we praise God. Praise God. Anyone want to unmute your phone? Any questions? We've got a couple minutes.
I see a lot of amens in the chat window. Anyone want to speak or say something? Any questions? Um, how you doing, Pastor Carter? This is uh, this is James Shamir's husband. James, how are you? All right. I just wanted to tell you that. Okay, me being 42 and, and coming up in in church and thinking I have an understanding about God and the Bible and everything, I just wanted to say, like with this teaching today, you open my eyes to a whole lot of stuff, and I just want to praise God for you. Praise God for you. That 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 was awesome, and I look forward to next week. But I just want to say, for for some reason, this this particular chapter here was for me and ministered to my soul so much and i just want to thank you praise god praise god thank you james for sharing that with us thank and thank you holy spirit for touching james heart and giving him that revelation praise god we just bless god and james god has put you in a position he's given you a wonderful wife and wonderful family and you just love them take good care of them when you don't know what to do ask god he will direct you what to do and remember, you have a relationship with God through Jesus Christ. That means God's going to bless you. He's going to meet every need. And you've got a wife who loves the Lord. And, 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 and your pastor, your pastor's awesome. So awesome. just stick together awesome. and yes. work together. Praise God. Thanks for sharing that. Anyone else yes. want to share Thank tonight? You. Then I want to close out with prayer. Alisa, Alisa had a question in the chat window. Alisa, unmute your phone, please. Yes. Hello. Hello. Um, I was, hi. Um, I was wondering, like, I know that David's bloodline goes back to Abraham, but was Bathsheba's bloodline in there also? Uh, Jesus is traced through David's bloodline, not Bathsheba. That's why... Um, um, in that genealogy, it was a David who was married to Bathsheba. No, the bloodline comes through David, not Bathsheba. Although Bathsheba is important because Solomon is the son of David and Bathsheba. Bathsheba. Okay, I I wasn't sure because of Solomon that like maybe she had a link somewhere also that they. Um, no, no, the link, the, the link, the link is that, um, and even when you ignore the negative things about her life and his life and the things they did that were wrong, they repented of their sins and, and God blesses. God does not cut the bloodline off because David sinned with Bathsheba. God graced them. And, and, um, uh, even though the, the child who was born, that was born out of that sinful situation died god blessed them with solomon and so the line the bloodline continues through solomon so that family was blessed isn't that amazing yes yes thank you okay any other questions Dr. Carter, think? yes i have a question it's yes. me sharon mm -hmm. um i was wondering if you could explain to us um why the men had multiple wives back then <laughs> Why, Sharon, you asked me to answer why the men had multiple wives back then. It was the Eastern culture. It's the Eastern culture. You still see it there. You see many of the Muslims in the East. And the Muslims are the descendants of, of uh, uh, um, Esau and um, Cain. And it's it's a thing. It's a thing of the East. Even in the Jewish communities, they had more than one wife. It's a part of their culture. Western culture, the culture we live in, Western culture has been more monogamous, one man, one woman, than the Eastern culture. Although we've had in our own Western culture, Sharon, uh, the, the Mormons and other groups who practice more than one wife but we're looking at in biblical times it was it was not a uh, an unusual thing for a man to have more than one wife we see this with uh, uh jacob having 
uh, two wives. Um, we see this with with many others. It was a, it was a cultural thing. Isn't it in scripture where the Lord would prefer us to be with one person? Yes, 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 yes. Um, and um, w when we go back to Genesis, uh, God said, a man shall leave his mother and father and cleave to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. That starts all the way back in Genesis. But then in, in the New Testament, in the New Testament, Paul begins teaching on monogamy. You see Romans chapter 7. Romans chapter 7 is one. New Testament, uh, one man, one wife is more of a New Testament thing than it is an Old Testament thing. Even though the seed is planted, God specifies his preference in the Old Testament when he says a man shall leave his uh, mother and father and cleave to his wife and the two shall become one flesh. Thank you for answering. Is there, I'm sure a lot of people have that question. <laughs> any any other questions relating to that? Anything else, Sharon? Um, no, I was just really curious about that um, because I think that in this day and age, um, if a man is with more than one woman, it can lead to other sins. It sure can. It sure can. And um, it, it sure can. Uh, I really believe that the Lord Jesus Christ, um, through his death on the cross, his resurrection, and um, everything that Paul writes about leads us, leads us to accept monogamy, monogamy, one man and one woman, as, as, as compared to polygyny and polygamy, which is practiced in many parts of the world. Uh, the, Christian, the Christian walk is a walk of one man with one woman and the whole the whole uh, scenario of Jesus dying on the cross to reconcile us back to God is is so co comparable Sharon so comparable to marriage of one man with one woman when we look at our relationship with Jesus we're married we are we are engaged Sharon we're betrothed to Jesus Christ we are scheduled to be married to Jesus okay and the church even though there may be millions of people in the church we are called the bride of Jesus Christ not the brides all right the bride okay thank you I appreciate it oh I appreciate talking with you anyone else well bless God it's seven minutes after eight here Eastern time we want you all to have a blessed night, and um, if there are any questions you may have, give me a call. We pray that all is well with you. Have a wonderful uh, resurrection celebration. Celebrate the, the death of Jesus Christ on the cross and his resurrection. And read that. Ladies and gentlemen, let us recommit ourselves to the Lord. Let the Lord come alive in us. I thank God for what James said. James uh, gave us a revelation of what God is doing in his life. James, at this point in your life, just let Jesus come alive like never before. And let's all do the same thing. Let's open our hearts to the Lord Jesus Christ and say, Lord, come alive in us, flow in us like rivers of living water. Just, just, just take that leap of faith. You see on the screen, when I was a Green Beret, I was a paratrooper. I jumped out of airplane 17 times sometimes at night not knowing what was on the ground or what was in the air i just took that leap of faith well when i get got saved i took a greater leap of faith i didn't have anybody kicking me out of the plane if i froze in the door no sergeant's gonna boot me out of the plane when i gave my life to jesus i just surrendered everything to him so i belong to you lord jesus everything whatever you want me to do I'm willing to do it. I just trust you. And even if I go into difficulty or, or experience sickness or even the threat of death, I'm not going to be afraid because my trust is in you. So um, just walk with him. Let this season, as we, as we experience Jesus dying on the cross for us, 
as we go back with him to Calvary and 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 we're dead with him in the grave and 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 every born again believer was in Christ in the grave our old man died in the and we died in him and when he rose up from the dead he rose up with us in him new creation we're new creations so so take that leap of faith ladies and gentlemen take that leap of leap of faith and trust the lord trust the lord god we thank you we thank you heavenly father we praise you lord jesus we thank you holy spirit we thank you that you're working a mighty work in all of us and you're giving us revelation knowledge you're raising up an army of prophets you're healing households marriages individuals families you're performing miracles signs and wonders and we give you the glory the honor and the praise and we surrender our lives to you draw us nigh unto you help us to continue studying your word fill us with your holy spirit help us to walk together in love lord and help us to be the salt of the earth to share your salt upon the whole earth to preserve this earth and to help win souls to the kingdom help us to proclaim who you are because there is none like you lord now i pray that you'll bless each and every one and meet every need they have and we praise you and honor you in Jesus' mighty name. Amen.